trash into clean burning power, neutralizing nuclear waste, capturing global warming gases, and stuffing them back in the earth. Meet the 21st century's growth industry. From green buildings to a river reborn. Now, environmental tech on Modern Marvels. The 21st century signals a crossroads for the planet known as Earth. And for its boldest, smartest, most insatiable inhabitants, the human race. Many of our accomplishments are double-edged. Human beings have taken a staggering toll on the planet that sustains us. We've cleared 50% of the world's forests, eliminated countless species, dammed mighty rivers, and burned millions of years of stored fossil energy in a century and a half. Our greatest impact on the planet and the greatest challenge for our civilization will most likely be the steady climb in temperatures over the next century. A consensus of national and international scientific organizations has linked the planet's current warming trend to human-created greenhouse gases. Those gases that trap the sun's heat in our atmosphere. The most significant greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. And the biggest source is our burning of oil, coal, and natural gas. 50 years from now, if we don't take major steps to reverse that trend, we're going to have orders of magnitude more CO2 in the atmosphere than we've ever had in scientifically recorded history, going back almost 700,000 years. The consequences of that, you know, we know in general what they will be. Floods, heat waves, shortages of water, shortages of food. We don't know what the scale will be. One of the most important solutions to the carbon dioxide problem is unfolding at an unlikely place, an oil field under the plains of Saskatchewan. This oil reservoir, known as the Mydale Field, is also a proving ground for the 21st century technology known as geologic carbon sequestration, capturing carbon emissions and burying them underground. The Mydale Field, operated by Apache Canada Limited, was first drilled in 1953. It has a total capacity of 515 million barrels of oil. But as with many reservoirs in the world, the easily recoverable oil has already been extracted. The oil here at Mydale is contained in rock similar to what you see here. It is rock, it's very solid, it looks somewhat like a sponge full of what they call bugs. Those vugs are filled with oil, and in some cases, oil and water. Uh, what is needed to be done is to get that oil from these rocks to a well to the surface. Uh, to do that, you need pressure. Since the 1960s, water injection has been used at the Mydale field to increase underground pressure and to push the oil toward the producing wells. But a large amount of the oil will cling to the rocks and that cannot be stripped using water. What needs to be done is a solvent uh, has to be injected down hole to combine in a miscible manner with the oil to strip it from the rocks. Apache has found that solvent in the form of carbon dioxide. When we inject CO2 into the reservoir, it goes into solution with the oil, changes the chemical and physical properties of the oil, allows it to break the bond it has with the rocks, and therefore we can produce that oil that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, uh, to do. Using CO2 to free oil from rock isn't a new technology. What's new is where the CO2 is coming from. 200 miles to the south in Beulah, North Dakota, is the Dakota Gasification Company, which burns coal to make synthetic fuels. The process also emits a lot of carbon dioxide into the air, or it did until recently. Now the CO2 emissions are captured at the smokestacks, compressed, and sent through a 200-mile pipeline into Canada. Both the Mydale field and the adjacent Weyburn field 
operated by Incana, use the CO2 in what's called Enhanced Oil Recovery, or EOR. After the CO2 has loosened the oil from the rock, the injector shoots down a water flood, which sweeps the reservoir. That is how we can direct the fluids in the reservoir from where we inject them to where we produce them. This well behind us is producing about 650 barrels a day of fluid, running at about 85% water, 15% oil. The witch's brew of oil, water, natural gas, and CO2 is separated into its various parts. Some of the CO2 will remain underground, tightly bound to the rock. The rest will be repressurized to 2,000 PSI, combined with the Dakota Pipeline CO2 and injected into the ground once again. Under the water flood uh, plan, we anticipated that the uh, life of the field was about 15 years. With CO2, we anticipate that the field will still be functional in 2045. The greenhouse gas will then be buried in the oil reservoir and all 280 wells capped in cement. The same dense rock that trapped oil and natural gas for millions of years should trap the CO2 for just as long. Besides oil reservoirs, scientists have targeted other areas for carbon sequestration, most notably deep saline aquifers and abandoned coal beds. We now return to environmental tech on Modern Marvels. The global estimate for carbon dioxide uh, emissions currently is between 23 and 24 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. The estimates of the global potential for geological storage is around 900 gigatons. There's more than enough potential for geological storage to look after our global emissions at this point. But carbon sequestration is costly. The price tag for the Mydale and Weyburn CO2 injection projects is about $200 million, not including the CO2 itself. But this hefty investment will allow Apache and Incana to generate 215 million barrels of otherwise unreachable oil, worth billions of dollars, an obvious incentive. The question is, who will pay for CO2 sequestration when there's no new oil to be recovered? The drive to find ways to reduce or, or store carbon so that it doesn't get emitted into the atmosphere um, is increasingly coming into the regulatory arena uh, with states like California putting uh, limits on the amount of carbon that utilities can emit. Far from the windswept plains of Saskatchewan, in the sun-baked desert of Arizona, Another company is finding a useful way to dispose of its carbon emissions. And it's quite literally green. The Red Hawk Power Generating Station, owned by Arizona Public Service, or APS, is a large combined cycle natural gas power plant. It burns natural gas to turn giant turbines, which generate a thousand megawatts of electricity. The major waste products from burning hydrocarbons are water and carbon dioxide, which is normally emitted as a greenhouse gas. But combine H2O, CO2, lots of Arizona sunshine, and you also get the magic formula for photosynthesis. So APS teamed up with a company called Green Fuel Technologies in this bold experiment. Capturing a portion of the power plant's greenhouse gases with algae. Algae has essentially one mission in life, eat CO2 and divide. And that makes it absolutely ideal to handle our uh, CO2 greenhouse emissions issues. The CO2 and wastewater are captured from the natural gas burning flue and piped over to these bioreactor tanks. Like all plants, the algae consume the carbon as food for their growth process and release only oxygen. The process begins in the nursery, where green fuel biologists raise various strains of algae. Almost all species of algae will double in one photo period of a day for eight hours. And in here, we get three photo periods in the nursery. We use the wastewater from the plant to grow these algae. 
So we adapt these algae to this particular location, to this particular water, to this particular flue gas. That makes them very robust relative to this area. The wonder plant is then transferred to the bioreactor, which is designed to evenly distribute sunlight and CO2 until the algae are ready to harvest. APS and green fuel aren't simply going to throw the algae away. If the harvested algae sludge looks a lot like oil, it's no coincidence. Like hydrocarbons, algae are chemically complex and bursting with energy. There's a three-step process that we're looking at right now for using the algae. The first step, we harvest the oils from the algae to make biodiesel. In the second step, we take the starch that's in the algae and we make ethanol from that. And, the, and what's left of the algae are proteins and we can use that for, for cattle feed. The harvested algae can also be dried and burned again in the power plant. The experiment has been so successful that APS and green fuel will soon be filling this entire structure with algae troughs. Scaling up this technology further will involve a much bigger leap. Capturing 100% of a plant's CO2 emissions will require about two acres of algae per megawatt, meaning a large plant like Red Hawk will need 2,000 acres. And with potentially profitable byproducts, algae's role in reducing carbon emissions may pay for itself. Reversing the carbon problem will require a number of simultaneous solutions, from saving forests and wetlands that naturally capture CO2, to expanding renewable energy technologies that never release carbon in the first place. Another solution to serious environmental crises is rising from the ground up. The green home and the green workplace. Over the course of the project, the Mydale and Weyburn oil fields will sequester about 43 million tons of carbon dioxide, the equivalent of removing 8.8 .8 million cars from the road for a year. Environmental Tech will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Environmental Tech on Modern Marvels. To find a root cause of many environmental woes, look no further than your own home or your own office. Buildings put an immense strain on the planet's resources. Probably 50, 60 percent of the power in this country goes not to cars, which you hear a lot about, but rather to air-conditioned heat and light buildings. Enter the Green Building. Its threefold goal, use fewer and more sustainable building materials, dramatically reduce energy and water consumption, and build without the use of toxic chemicals. Living proof is this sleek, modernist three-bedroom house built by Living Homes in Santa Monica, California. Environmental considerations began even before construction. The living home consists of 11 prefabricated steel-framed modules, which were assembled on site in just one day. The prefab design greatly cuts down on construction waste. Standard home construction is extremely wasteful. 30, 40 percent of your materials will end up in landfill. When you prefabricate, in general, on average, about 2 percent of your materials end up in construction waste because you use shop drawings for everything. It's very precisely cut. Recycled and sustainable materials abound. And all surfaces were built without toxic chemicals, such as formaldehyde, which is commonly used in adhesives and coatings. The counters in the kitchen are made out of newsprint or cellulose. Shower dividers that are made out of reclaimed uh, plastic resin. Where wood is used, it's cut from a sustainably harvested stand, as certified by the Forest Stewardship Council. This practice helps to preserve the world's best source of carbon sequestration, old growth forests. The cost of building this home, designed by renowned architect Ray Cappy, is $250 per square foot, above the national average. But the costs of building green can gradually be offset. Ideally, a green home generates much of its own energy and then uses that energy as efficiently as possible. A solar thermal system heats all the hot water, which is also piped under the floor 
to provide efficient radiant heat from the ground up. Photovoltaic panels provide nearly all of the building's electricity, a feat made easier by highly efficient ENERGY STAR appliances. LED lights, which use one-tenth the power of incandescence, and the use of free, abundant sunshine. Green living isn't just for sunny California homes. Across the nation, in the heart of New York City, the same concepts are being put into action on a much larger scale. This is the Solaire, a high-rise residential tower home to nearly 700 residents in Lower Manhattan. With its own water treatment system and efficient use of electricity, it uses 55% less water and 37% less energy than a comparable building. The Solaire's most impressive feature may be its two green roofs, which use the power of plants to insulate the building and capture rainwater. The main benefit here with the roof is it helps with the heat island effect. The heat island effect is created by a city's dark asphalt streets, and especially by thousands of dark absorptive roofs, which trap the sun's heat and make a city up to six degrees warmer than nearby areas during the summer. The plants reflect sunlight and cool the surrounding air through a process called evapotranspiration, the plant's way of sweating. The green roof is an insulator. It keeps the heat in in the winter and out in the summertime. The plants are merely the top layer of the roof's sophisticated drainage system. During storms, the multi-layered green roof captures up to 80% of the rainwater, which normally flows into sewers that quickly overflow. Stormwater runoff is the biggest source of coastal water pollution. The water tends to run off of buildings, into the gutter, and then out into the ocean. When it's in the gutter, it's picking up all of the filth, all of the animal feces, all of the oil and toxic uh, releases, carrying them out into the coastal waters. Living roofs are just one of the green technologies spreading in concrete jungles like New York. A few miles uptown from the Solaire, the new headquarters for the Hearst Corporation, one of this network's parent companies, proved that even a skyscraper can be green from the ground up. For the 46-story Hearst Tower, this meant not just saving the Art Deco facade of the original headquarters, but recycling 85% of the old building's materials. There was green thinking behind the unique steel exoskeleton, too. By putting the skeleton of the building around on the outside so that you can actually see it, it became a much more efficient structure. That triangle or diagram uses less steel than a normal structure. There are less columns throwing in the middle of your floor plate. But at the same time, it braces the building in a much more efficient way. More efficient framing means more opportunity for windows and natural light. Environmentally responsible design reached into major structural features and the smallest details. This wall system itself uses high efficiency glass. That means there's more iron in the glass, which allows more natural daylight in, but not enough that it actually gets too hot here, which means that you need less artificial light. The Hearst Tower, like the Solaire, collects and recycles its own stormwater. It's just a lot more water. This tank is 14,000 gallons. Uh, this is where the stormwater is held. Uh, the walls are 18-inch thick concrete walls. The stormwater is triple filtered and then pumped into the air conditioning system, where it supplies the cooling towers. They're running 4,000 tons of cooling through those towers, uh, of course, in the height of the summer. Um, that's your biggest, biggest usage. That's what's driving your water meter. The storm runoff also supplies the distinctive water feature known as ice fall, which cools and humidifies the atrium. Thanks largely to the stormwater system, the Hearst Tower uses 10% less water than a normal skyscraper. It also uses 26% less electricity. That will lead to another kind of green saving. This is our home for the next 100 years, and those technologies if you take 26% energy savings just in the electric alone and then extrapolate that over the lifetime of this building, it's truly efficient how much money we're going to save as a corporation. 
There are plenty of people that thought you couldn't build green in New York City, and I think we proved them wrong. And the advice that I would give anyone that would undertake this project is come look at our project, do what we did, and then do one better. The green building revolution is something everyone can participate in. Other environmental technologies are best left to the experts, like cleaning up a deadly legacy of the nuclear age. If every American household replaced just one incandescent light bulb with a compact fluorescent bulb, the amount of pollution avoided would be equivalent to removing nearly 800,000 cars from the road. Environmental Tech will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to Environmental Tech on Modern Marvels. This is the Department of Energy's top secret Y-12 complex in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge National Lab was one of the United States' principal sites for enriching uranium and developing nuclear bombs. From World War II to the end of the Cold War, much of the work took place at Y-12. There's actually three plants, uh, Y-12, uh, X-10, and, and uh, K-25. And it was all part of the Manhattan Project during World War II uh, to help develop nuclear weapons and get the first uh, uranium enriched in order to uh, develop the bombs that were used in, uh, in Hiroshima, for example. Over the decades, the uranium and other toxic wastes were simply buried underground. They were doing this all very rapidly, so they didn't really have time to get rid of the waste in the, what we would consider now a proper fashion. So wastes were pumped from the Y-12 plant where they were processing parts for uh, nuclear weapons and discharging the waste uh, in the ponds there. Y-12 discharged millions of gallons of waste from nuclear weapons manufacturing into these ponds until 1984. The ponds were then drained, capped, and covered with a parking lot. But that didn't stop the highly mobile, water-soluble form of uranium, known as U-6, from leaching into the local groundwater, which contains up to a thousand times the legal concentration of uranium. The first step in cleaning up this mess is to take a sample of the groundwater layer. When we bring up a core, we'll test it in uh, various ways. We'll start by scanning it with a beta gamma meter, which is this instrument here. And this is a sample we've taken earlier from our field plot. It has uh, a fair amount of activity in it. As you can hear, the counts go off. The more counts, uh, the more activity. We can interrogate it further with uh, something called an X-ray fluorimeter and it sends out those x-rays and then it, you can tell by how much the each individual element fluoresces, how much of those elements are in here. And you can actually quantify it in the parts per million level. Y-12 and other Department of Energy sites are facing a challenge that until recently was thought insurmountable. There's probably about 32 different states that have uranium contamination. Uh, a lot of it's related to both the mining of the uh, uranium and actually the processing of it at, at different plants. So it's fairly widespread and it's the DOE problem in particular because of, of, of the business that DOE is in. To tackle what may end up being the largest environmental cleanup job in history, scientists from Oak Ridge National Lab have begun experimenting with an innovative form of bioremediation. Bioremediation is a uh a methodology that uses living systems like microbes or bacteria to actually process the contaminants in the soil into forms that are less hazardous. Using bioremediation to stabilize heavy metals like uranium-6 was a radical, unproven technology. A tough job became even tougher when the soil and groundwater at Y-12 were revealed to contain so many toxins besides uranium that helpful microbes didn't stand a chance of survival. It has PCE in it, uh, which is a, a toxic organic, and uh, an array of different types of metals, nickel, uh, very high concentrations of aluminum. So before scientists can even attempt to bioremediate the uranium, they pump the groundwater to the surface and through a gauntlet of chemical transformations. The first uses a vacuum stripper and carbon filters to remove volatile organic toxins from the water. The next step is the groundwater is 
brought over to these holding tanks where the first thing we have to remove is the aluminum. And at this particular site, the aluminum concentrations are very high on the order of like 400 to 500 part per million. It's dredged and pumped into another holding tank in the back. The water still contains massive amounts of toxic nitrate, which was used to clean nuclear weapons instrumentation. So the water is pumped inside this fluidized bed reactor, where microorganisms denitrify the nitrate. Finally, the water is pumped back underground, and the main task can begin, stimulating microscopic bugs to convert highly mobile, soluble uranium-6 into stable, insoluble uranium-4. The first step is to pump into the soil and groundwater, an energy source that will stimulate the microbes. In this case, it's ethanol. So when we put methanol or ethanol or acetate in the groundwater, we're feeding the bacteria. And when they're fed, then they have to respire. They have to use the metals um, to do that. As the bacteria respire, they release an extra electron, which attaches to certain metals, including uranium. Electrons, which carry a negative charge, reduce the oxidation state of uranium. That is, they lower the number of positive charges on each uranium atom. That's a very, very important feature because if I reduce, for example, the oxidation state of uranium from uranium-6 to uranium-4, that uh, uranium is no longer soluble in water. It doesn't flow along with the groundwater. It precipitates out and sits there in, in the soil in a very stable way. Thus far, the stable uranium-4 is sticking to the soil and away from the groundwater. The project's remarkable success has attracted worldwide scientific attention. Although still unproven on a large scale, it's seen as a major breakthrough in stabilizing not just uranium, but other toxic metals. For the DOE cleanup job alone, bioremediation may also save taxpayers an awfully steep bill. The estimated cost of cleaning that up using conventional technologies is something like $300 billion. The bioremediation approach can be much cheaper, actually safer, because you don't have to dig it up, you don't have to truck it over roads, you don't have to expose people to it. As scientists at Oak Ridge National Laboratory continue to study this microscopic solution to a gigantic waste problem, Industry is finding novel uses for other sources of waste, from paper sludge to millions of tons of landfill garbage. The Department of Energy is faced with cleaning up 1.4 billion cubic feet of contaminated soil, enough to fill 17 sports stadiums, and 1.7 trillion gallons of contaminated groundwater. Environmental Tech will return on Modern Marvels. Now return to environmental tech on Modern Marvels. Recycling. It's become almost a cliche of the environmental movement and as routine as taking out the garbage. But recycling waste materials into useful products can and does have profound impacts on the environment. Take the aluminum can. 95% of the energy saved when you recycle aluminum aluminum can, for example, versus making it in a virgin manner. Nationwide, it's like 15 million barrels of oil are saved through recycling aluminum cans and whatnot. One ton of recycled paper saves about 30 trees, not to mention 7,000 gallons of water, 4,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, and 60 pounds of air pollutants. The paper industry by is probably the second or third energy intensive industry in the world. At Nina Paper, located along the Fox River in Wisconsin, they're recycling a lot more than paper. Everything from water to sludge to steam power is part of a giant self-sustaining loop. As the paper making process begins, Nina Paper feeds significant amounts of post-consumer waste into its pulpers. Post-consumer fiber, by its definition, is, is paper products, a lot of them heavily printed, that have met their final use from the end consumer. That company that collects it does some decoloring and then chips it in this final form, which is 50% moisture. 
the recycled material is combined with virgin pulp, along with dyes, additives, and a lot more water. As the pulp begins its journey across the paper maker, it's composed of 90% water. The paper making process is nothing more than a gigantic controlled process of removing water from that solution. The paper maker applies gravity, pressure, and steam heat to remove this water. The extracted water and small bits of unused pulp then move to the treatment plant. 30% of the water will be recycled back into the paper making process. Thanks to extensive bioremediation, the remaining water is returned to the Fox River, cleaner than it left it. The solid waste, known in the paper industry by the technical term sludge, is too far gone to be recycled back into paper. So every day, 1,300 tons of the sludge from the Nina Mill and other local paper mills are trucked to the nearby Fox Valley Energy Center, where the waste is burned cleanly as a biofuel. The solid portion of the sludge is about 50% paper fiber, which is good biomass material, and it burns very well. The remaining 50% of the solid material is inorganic. It's the ash, the mineral fiber, and clay, which does not burn very well. This inorganic material is melted into a glass-like substance, then flash-cooled into glass aggregate, which will be used in everything from asphalt to sandpaper. The organic portion of the sludge is burned in this seven-story boiler. This boiler is designed to produce 300,000 pounds per hour of steam at 350 pounds per square inch and 600 degrees F. This so-called green steam is then pipelined back to Nina Paper, where it provides all the steam used to dry the paper. The green steam has almost entirely replaced the plant's natural gas boilers, which often sit idle. We've reduced our consumption of natural gas by over 80%. So it replaces a fossil fuel with something that's been a, was a waste in the process before. So it's great energy savings, great environmental savings. Turning the sludge into steam also brings benefits to the local environment. If this plant was shut down tomorrow, the local county landfills here would be full within, within a year. Landfills. Traditionally, they've been the antithesis of recycling. Places where millions of tons of potentially useful material come to die a slow, unsightly, smelly death. They're also one of the world's leading producers of methane. This greenhouse gas, more damaging than carbon dioxide, is emitted as the garbage decomposes. But today's landfills have discovered how to recycle greenhouse gases into clean burning energy. At the South Shelby landfill near Memphis, Tennessee, Allied Waste has teamed up with several environmental partners to harness the power of methane. What we're standing on top of is actually waste that's been buried, oh, at least five years or more. And we're standing on top of an active live gas well that's extracting methane out from subsurface. 120 of these perforated wells, sunk between 65 and 135 feet into the garbage, pull up 5,000 cubic feet per minute of landfill gas. That's enough to heat 30,000 homes. These vertical wells are placed around 100 to 150 feet apart from each other, basically in a circle around the buried waste. What we want to do is create a zone of influence between these gas wells to where we're not having any kind of gas, any kind of methane migrate either outward or downward. We don't want to get into the groundwater, we don't want it to get into the atmosphere, and we don't want it to travel off site somehow. A slight vacuum pulls all the gas to a common header. This is an 18 inch pipe. Everything comes out here, it's extracted from the blower. The blower is pulling a gradual vacuum on this. After the gas is compressed, it's sent through this pipeline to the Soleil Company, a nearby food processing plant. The plant, which produces various food products from soybeans, is the largest of its kind in the world. Landfill gas provides virtually 100% of the prodigious steam heat needed for Soleil's processing. 
The old natural gas pipeline goes largely unused. The landfill gas does release carbon dioxide when burned, but it still brings a twofold green benefit. Eliminating methane, the more potent greenhouse gas, and replacing the CO2 emissions of the natural gas that's no longer burned. Human ingenuity can turn a nuisance into a valuable resource. It can also return a river to its natural state, which may save cities as well as ecosystems. A landfill in Florida will soon be using plasma arc technology to vaporize its garbage at 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The 3,000 tons of trash burned daily will generate enough electricity to power 36,000 homes. Environmental tech will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to environmental tech on Modern Marvels. When Hurricane Katrina left much of New Orleans underwater, it was easy to trace the deadly flood surge to the failed system of levees. But behind the failed levees lay another, less obvious reason for the catastrophic flooding the steady disappearance of Louisiana's marshy wetlands. The wetlands have disappeared largely because for many decades, the lower Mississippi River has been narrowly channeled and cut off from its traditional floodplain. The river can no longer deposit its nutrient-rich silt to create wetlands and barrier islands, which vanish under the encroaching Gulf of Mexico at the rate of 34 square miles every year. Wetlands and the river ecosystems, known as riparian corridors, are nature's built-in flood control. Hydraulic engineers estimate that every mile of wetland or riparian forest absorbs one foot of a hurricane storm surge. They act like huge sponges, and uh, they have a, a really um, large ability to attenuate flood flows. And so riparian filter strips and, and forests can slow down the water, they can spread the water out, they can absorb some of that flood energy, and they can allow for the downstream areas more time to, to move that water through. 2,000 miles away from Louisiana, in California's Central Valley, restoring riparian corridors has taken on a similar urgency. 95% of California's riparian ecosystems are gone. In areas like the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, home to 500,000 people and some of the nation's most valuable farmland, the only protection against a catastrophic flood is an aging system of levees. The city of Sacramento is ranked as the, the next highest or next most probable metropolitan area at risk in the country. River Partners, a nonprofit group, is working on the long-term solution, restoring California's decimated riparian corridors. They replace former flood-prone farmland, like this 1,700-acre project along the San Joaquin River, with the area's original ecosystem, including 270,000 trees. The two main goals, building a high-quality riparian habitat for wildlife and rebuilding nature's flood buffers. The planting is hardly random. It's based on a computer simulation of a flood through the area and the varying structures of the plants themselves. In an area where we know that the velocity of the flood waters will be higher, uh, we would not plant trees. Uh, trees are very rigid, they'll back the water up. So we plant more flexible plants, such as the rose and the blackberry, which are very flexible with the, the high-speed water. So that's a very critical part of the design here, is how will the flood waters move? While earth movers scoop out the areas that will become wetlands, tractors dig furrows for a precise mosaic of native trees and grasses, from valley oaks, to coyote brush. In three years, this empty field will look like this. Pretty amazing. You build it and they'll, they'll find it. They come. So, I mean, right now there's not a whole lot of wildlife out here, but you come out in three years and it'll probably be teeming wildlife. For the first three years, river partners will drip and flood irrigate the plantings, 
using water from the San Joaquin River. After three years, the forest is self-sufficient. Vegetation is strategically planted on the levees themselves to prevent erosion. This levee, which was breached in the flood of 1997, will stay breached, replaced by the new riparian forest. Healthy river corridors will do more than attract wildlife and provide recreation. In the long run, they'll preserve the long-term viability of fisheries, farms, and cities. As with other environmental technologies, there's a paradox at work. Human ingenuity restoring nature's delicate balance, which has been altered by human intervention. But this paradox is necessary because the health of the planet and the tenuous fate of civilization are linked more closely now than ever. Scaling up this technology further will involve a much bigger leap. Capturing 100% of a plant's CO2 emissions will require about two acres of algae per megawatt, meaning a large plant like Red Hawk will need 2,000 acres. And with potentially profitable byproducts, algae's role in reducing carbon emissions may pay for itself. Reversing the carbon problem will require a number of simultaneous solutions, from saving forests and wetlands that naturally capture CO2, to expanding renewable energy technologies that never release carbon in the first place. Another solution to serious environmental crises is rising from the ground up, the green home and the green workplace. Over the course of the project, the Mydale and Weyburn oil fields will sequester about 43 million tons of carbon dioxide, the equivalent of removing 8.8 .8 million cars from the road for a year. Environmental tech will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to environmental tech on Modern Marvels. To find a root cause of many environmental woes, look no further than your own home or your own office. Buildings put an immense strain on the planet's resources. Probably 50, 60 percent of the power in this country goes not to cars, which you hear a lot about, but rather to air-conditioned heat and light buildings. Enter the Green Building. Its threefold goal, use fewer and more sustainable building materials, dramatically reduce energy and water consumption, and build without the use of toxic chemicals. Living proof is this sleek, modernist three-bedroom house built by Living Homes in Santa Monica, California. Environmental considerations began even before construction. The Living Home consists of 11 prefabricated steel-framed modules, which were assembled on site in just one day. The prefab design greatly cuts down on construction waste. Standard home construction is extremely wasteful. 30, 40 percent of your materials will end up in landfill. When you prefabricate, in general, on average, about 2 percent of your materials end up in construction waste because you use shop drawings for everything. It's very precisely cut. Recycled and sustainable materials abound. And all surfaces were built without toxic chemicals. Canada Limited was first drilled in 1953. It has a total capacity of 515 million barrels of oil. But as with many reservoirs in the world, the easily recoverable oil has already been extracted. The oil here at Mydale is contained in rock similar to what you see here. It is rock, it's very solid, it looks somewhat like a sponge full of what they call bugs. Those bugs are filled with oil and in some cases oil and water. Uh, what is needed to be done is to get that oil from these rocks to a well to the surface. Uh, to do that, you need pressure. Since the 1960s, water injection has been used at the Mydale field to increase underground pressure and to push the oil toward the producing wells. But a large amount of the oil will cling to the rocks and that cannot be stripped using water. What needs to be done is a solvent uh, has to be injected downhole 
to combine in a miscible manner with the oil to strip it from the rocks. Apache has found that solvent in the form of carbon dioxide. When we inject CO2 into the reservoir, it goes into solution with the oil, changes the chemical and physical properties of the oil, allows it to break the bond it has with the rocks, and therefore we can produce that oil that we wouldn't otherwise be able to, uh, to do. Using CO2 to free oil from rock isn't a new technology. What's new is where the CO2 is coming from. 200 miles to the south, in Beulah, North Dakota, is the Dakota Gasification Company, which burns coal to make synthetic fuels. The process also emits a lot of carbon dioxide into the air, or it did until recently. Now the CO2 emissions are captured at the smokestacks, compressed, and sent through a 200-mile pipeline into Canada. Both the Mydale field and the adjacent Weyburn field, operated by Incana, use the CO2 in what's called Enhanced Oil Recovery, or EOR. After the CO2 has loosened the oil from the rock, the injector shoots down a water flood, which sweeps the reservoir. That is how we can direct the fluids in the reservoir from where we inject them to where we produce them. This well behind us is producing about 650 barrels a day of fluid, running at about 85% water, 50. Turning trash into clean burning power, neutralizing nuclear waste, capturing global warming gases, and stuffing them back in the earth. Meet the 21st century's growth industry. From green buildings to a river reborn. Now, environmental tech on Modern Marvels. The 21st century signals a crossroads for the planet known as Earth. And for its boldest, smartest, most insatiable inhabitants, the human race. Many of our accomplishments are double-edged. Human beings have taken a staggering toll on the planet that sustains us. We've cleared 50% of the world's forests, eliminated countless species, dammed mighty rivers, and burned millions of years of stored fossil energy in a century and a half. Our greatest impact on the planet and the greatest challenge for our civilization will most likely be the steady climb in temperatures over the next century. A consensus of national and international scientific organizations has linked the planet's current warming trend to human-created greenhouse gases. Those gases that trap the sun's heat in our atmosphere. The most significant greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. And the biggest source is our burning of oil, coal, and natural gas. 50 years from now, if we don't take major steps to reverse that trend, we're going to have orders of magnitude more CO2 in the atmosphere than we've ever had in scientifically recorded history, going back almost 700,000 years. The consequences of that you know, we know in general what they will be. Floods, heat waves, shortages of water, shortages of food. We don't know what the scale will be. One of the most important solutions to the carbon dioxide problem is unfolding at an unlikely place, an oil field under the plains of Saskatchewan. This oil reservoir known as the Mydale field is also a proving ground for the 21st century technology known as geologic carbon sequestration. Capturing carbon emissions and burying them underground. The Mydale field operated by Apache... 15% oil. The witch's brew of oil, water, natural gas, and CO2 is separated into its various parts. Some of the CO2 will remain underground, tightly bound to the rock. The rest will be repressurized to 2,000 PSI, combined with the Dakota Pipeline CO2, and injected into the ground once again. Under the water flood uh, plan, we anticipated that the 
uh, life of the field was about 15 years. With CO2, we anticipate that the field will still be functional in 2045. The greenhouse gas will then be buried in the oil reservoir and all 280 wells capped in cement. The same dense rock that trapped oil and natural gas for millions of years should trap the CO2 for just as long. Besides oil reservoirs, scientists have targeted other areas for carbon sequestration. Most notably, deep saline aquifers and abandoned coal beds. We now return to environmental tech on Modern Marvels. The global estimate for carbon dioxide uh, emissions currently is between 23 and 24 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. The estimates of the global potential for geological storage is around 900 gigatons. There's more than enough potential for geological storage to look after our global emissions at this point. But carbon sequestration is costly. The price tag for the Mydale and Weyburn CO2 injection projects is about $200 million, not including the CO2 itself. But this hefty investment will allow Apache and Incana to generate 215 million barrels of otherwise unreachable oil, worth billions of dollars, an obvious incentive. The question is, who will pay for CO2 sequestration when there's no new oil to be recovered? The drive to find ways to reduce or, or store carbon so that it doesn't get emitted into the atmosphere um, is increasingly coming into the regulatory arena uh, with states like California putting uh, limits on the amount of carbon that utilities can emit. Far from the windswept plains of Saskatchewan, in the sun-baked desert of Arizona, another company is finding a useful way to dispose of its carbon emissions. And it's quite literally green. The Red Hawk Power Generating Station, owned by Arizona Public Service, or APS, is a large combined cycle natural gas power plant. It burns natural gas to turn giant turbines, which generate a thousand megawatts of electricity. The major waste products from burning hydrocarbons are water and carbon dioxide, which is normally emitted as a greenhouse gas. But combine H2O, CO2, lots of Arizona sunshine, and you also get the magic formula for photosynthesis. So APS teamed up with a company called Green Fuel Technologies in this bold experiment, capturing a portion of the power plant's greenhouse gases with algae. Algae has essentially one mission in life, eat CO2 and divide. And that makes it absolutely ideal to handle our uh, CO2 greenhouse emissions issues. The CO2 and wastewater are captured from the natural gas burning flu and piped over to these bioreactor tanks. Like all plants, the algae consume the carbon as food for their growth process and release only oxygen. The process begins in the nursery, where green fuel biologists raise various strains of algae. Almost all species of algae will double in one photo period of a day for eight hours. And in here, we get three photo periods in the nursery. We use the wastewater from the plant to grow these algae. So we adapt these algae to this particular location, to this particular water, to this particular flue gas. That makes them very robust relative to this area. The wonder plant is then transferred to the bioreactor, which is designed to evenly distribute sunlight and CO2 until the algae are ready to harvest. APS and green fuel aren't simply going to throw the algae away. If the harvested algae sludge looks a lot like oil, it's no coincidence. Like hydrocarbons, algae are chemically complex and bursting with energy. There's a three-step process that we're looking at right now for using the algae. The first step, we harvest the oils from the algae to make biodiesel. In the second step, we take the starch that's in the algae and we make ethanol from that. And, the, and what's left of the algae are proteins and we can use that for, for cattle feed. The harvested algae can also be dried and burned again in the power plant. The experiment has been so successful 
that APS and Green Fuel will soon be filling this entire structure with algae troughs. 